Welcome everyone to the Encore presentation of the State of the Lake. We'll begin in just a moment as people are just popping into this Zoom meeting. All right. We're just going to get going and we'll let more people pop in as they as they arrive into this meeting. Welcome everyone to this encore presentation of the state of the lake. My name is Rebecca Hansen. I'm the executive director for the Newfound Lake Region Association. Most of the names in the in the talk here are uh, that I'm seeing are pretty familiar, but I just want to give um, those who might be newer to NLRA a little bit of an introduction to who we are and what we do. Um, so the Newfound Lake Region Association is our mission is to protect Newfound Lake and its watershed. We do that in a number of different ways through water quality monitoring and water quality protection, invasive species prevention, land conservation and stewardship, and that includes includes managing our Gray Rocks Conservation Area property in Hebron. And of course, we do a lot of education events as well. Um, for example, the State of the Lake presentation, communicating about our work and communicating about the health of the lake and the watershed and all the efforts that go into protecting it are critically important to us being able to continue our work um, into the future and to actually make a difference in the Newfound watershed. So thank you all for being a part of this talk tonight. Thank you to our volunteers and our members and for all of you who help support the, the work that we do. Um, I am really pleased to be here to introduce this fourth uh, State of the Lake. This is our encore presentation. We had a number of people, I think about 40, attend the in-person presentation, and we had such good reception to the talk that we thought we'd open it up to a remote presentation as well, so those who aren't in the area can, can benefit from this talk as well. Um, we started doing the State of the Lake in 2020 as a way to communicate and create a conversation around the, the health of the lake and the watershed. Um, since the lake and the watershed are a, a vital part of a health, the healthy com, uh, community and economy. Um, so through the State of the Lake presentation, we talk about the current state of the lake, how it's doing right now, um, and how that compares to decades upon decades, uh, nearly 40 years of water quality uh, data on the lake. And we all take great pride in the, the, the quality of the water in Newfound Lake, and rightly so. But this year we've seen some challenges. We continue to see challenges. Uh, it hasn't been that long since last summer, which was wet and full of um, some unpleasant weather and what was not great for us who enjoy being outside, it also wasn't great for the lake. And Paul will talk more about that. Um, and so making sure we understand how the lake is doing and understand the efforts that we can take to make sure we maintain that healthy water quality that's so important to us is really important. Um, so before I turn it over to Paul, I just want to make sure that um, it's best for everyone if everyone's got their microphone and their cameras turned off. We are recording this, so trying to keep it as streamlined as possible for so the viewers in the future. Um, and if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat while Paul is speaking. We may have time for questions in, in a couple of section breaks, but we'll definitely have a Q&A session at the end. So um, if there are any immediate questions, put them in there. I'll do my best to answer. I'll direct them to Paul as I see fit, and then we'll, we'll open it up a little more broadly. Um, at the end of everything. So uh, that's enough for me. Um, I would like to turn it over to our conservation program manager, Paul Pellisier. Paul's been with us for just over two years at the Newfound Lake Region Association, has made quite a difference here in how we look at our water quality data, how we collect our water quality data, and how we make sure that our we are working to improve water quality as well. So thank you everyone for being here, and I will turn it over to Paul now. Excellent. Let me just go ahead and pull up this presentation so that um, you have something else to look at besides our smug mugs up here on the screen. Um, Rebecca, do you just want to confirm that we are indeed looking at the right presentation here? I am seeing the presentation. Great. Um, yeah, I just want to extend uh, the welcome to folks that uh, are abroad who couldn't make it in person. Um, I was really excited to see quite quite a large crowd at the in-person event um, and some faces, some faces that were less familiar to us. Um, I think that speaks to kind of the growing impact and the growing community that we have here around Newfound Lake. 
Um, Rebecca mentioned that I am the conservation program manager here at NLRA. And what I often tell people that means is that I'm responsible for kind of our boots on the ground type conservation work. Uh, so whether that's water quality monitoring, um, stormwater prevention, which those two things will kind of be uh, top billing of tonight's presentation, uh, invasive species pr prevention, um, or working with volunteers uh, are all part of my job. But I also tell people that far and away, the best part of my job is getting to uh, live and, and work in my home watershed. Um, so I, I spend my time getting to understand and connect and learn more about uh, our local environment here. And um, it's really in that spirit that these Sail of Lake presentations um, are, are made. So tonight's presentation, Rebecca mentioned that we'll have a couple section breaks the, the presentation is really outlined in three parts. Um, so first we will uh, dive into the numbers, both in terms of uh, impact or inputs rather uh, from all of the rain that we got in 2023, uh, and then all of the impacts that we saw from that rain in our water quality uh, record. Um, next, we'll go on somewhat of a virtual tour of the watershed and we'll compare and contrast how um, rainwater interacts with natural and developed landscapes uh, and how where exactly that rain falls makes a big difference uh, in terms of the impact seen downstream. Um, and lastly, it wouldn't be an NLRA presentation if we didn't take the opportunity and um, the relative captive audience, although I guess you guys are all free to leave at any point to go eat dinner, um, to talk about uh, our programs, the work that we're doing to, to really protect uh, Newfound Lake's water quality uh, and the, the watershed at large. So I should be able to change my slides. <laughs> Let's see. Bear with me, folks, after that lovely preamble. Um, all right, Rebecca, can you confirm that I am uh, on track again? You are. We got a quick flash of your email for a second, but uh, but we're back on the the presentation. Yeah, all very important things. Um, <laughs> so so of course, there's more to a watershed than just the water. Uh, tonight's presentation will talk a lot about the physical elements, right? The connection between landscape and rain and water, a little bit about geology and how that water moves through the through the system. Um, but I think one of the real strengths of NLRA's work is the acknowledgement and the connection, like Rebecca said, um, to the more human dimensions of of the watershed, right? We we live here, we work here. Uh, if you are tuning in from afar. I would bet that some of your personal identity is tied to that clean, clear water of Newfound Lake. Um, and I, I say it again and again that, that our work and the impact that we can generate um, is, is really it hinges on um, the engagement that we have with our community and the support from folks like you. Um, so, with that, I always tend to begin these talks in the same way, and that's that's really rooting our work in that watershed. And so that there's there's a couple of physical um, points that I want everyone to walk away from tonight's presentation with. Um, and so let me work you through this slide. The first point to take away is that our watershed is really large relative to the size of our lake. Um, so at just over 56,000 acres for the watershed and 4,000 uh, 451 acres for the lake, that's about a 13 to one ratio. And as you might expect, when the area of that watershed increases relative to the size of a water body, there's more uh, opportunity um, for water to pick up different contaminants to interact with that landscape and eventually um, make its way down to the lake. The second point I want to make here is that our watershed is primarily forested. Um, these forests, these large forest parcels do a lot to protect water quality. Um, not only do their roots hold soil um, and their, their leaves evaporate water, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, um, but there's a whole host of ecosystem services 
that forests provide for us, habitat, uh, scenic engagement, uh, and again, make up part of that kind of cultural identity of, of our region. Um, and it's, it's no small part uh, of the secret that keeps Newfound Lake so clean is the percentage of forest. Um, now it's not all forested, of course, we, we do live here. <laughs> Um, there is some concentrated development, mainly focused around town centers and uh, ringing the, the shoreline of Newfound Lake. Um, and these, these areas have a real impact. Um, Newfound Lake's largest threat to long-term, um, in terms of long-term water quality, is um, stormwater erosion, stormwater pollution from developed areas. And so while we'll dig into that fact, quite a bit tonight. I hope that it is not demoralizing, but but rather um, represents a call to action, is inspiring because stormwater pollution uh, is really a problem of our own making, but it's a problem where the solutions are, are known. And by and large, they're, they're relatively simple and cost-effective to install. Um, and I definitely want everyone who's listening tonight or in the future to know that NLRA is here as a, as a resource to folks dealing with stormwater issues in the watershed, um, because it's also uh, stormwater <clears throat> affects a, our infrastructure, but also affects our environment. And so working to address it is really a win-win. Um, the last thing I want you to know is that our watershed is really steep. Um, this image doesn't do justice to just how large the watershed is. If we look at this um, outline, it's it's really about, it looks like Newfound is about one-sixth, one-seventh of that total area. Um, but because it's so steep and rugged and there's all sorts of hills and valleys and nooks and crannies in there, that's where we get that large difference. And because it's so steep, when water does fall in the watershed, it very quickly moves um, into our stream network and, and finds its way um, down to our lake in, in record time. Uh, when water, of course, moves downhill quickly, it also generates a lot of force. Uh, and when not managed properly, of course, um, we see the impacts that that can have. So watershed's large, it's mostly forested, development is an issue. Uh, and uh, we live in a very steep area. So I'm going to dive into the numbers here, um, and I just want to state the obvious fact that it rained a lot, and I will spend the next five to seven minutes explaining that very obvious fact. But of course, all of that rain, all of those inputs have a, a real pronounced impact both on infrastructure uh, and water quality. So I'm going to attempt to explain this graphically. Um, so let me walk you through um, this figure here. So we're going to be looking at year over year accumulation, accumulated precipitation across the bottom here. We've got our calendar year from January to December. And on the vertical axis, we've got precipitation accumulation in inches. So as, as time moves on, we'll move to the right. And as we get more rain events, our line will, will move vertically. So we'll, we'll expect to see some sort of diagonal line appear across the screen. Now, if we look at our 30-year average rainfall, you see a, a beautiful straight line. Uh, but you see that um, on a, any given year, we can expect to have a 40, just over 46 inches of rain, which is a lot of rain, but our ecosystems and our infrastructure by and large are, are built and have evolved to handle that. Let's look at 2023. Um, and there's a couple of things that your eye probably jumps to immediately. Uh, first is the overall number. Uh, so in 2023, we had 57.6 inches of rain. That's over 11 inches above that 30 year mark. Um, that's roughly 22, 23% uh, above what we expect to find. That's a lot of rain, no matter how you slice it. Um, and our infrastructure and our ecosystems deal with that amount of rain uh, differently. The next thing I want you to cue in on are all these large vertical leaps. So these are individual storm events. Um, and I've highlighted the ones here that, that deposited more than an inch of rain in 24 hours. 
Um, throughout the year, we had 17 of these events. Uh, in the stormwater world, we call these water quality protection volumes, which is very jargony. But what that means is that when rain falls at this rate, um, it really quickly has the ability to, to do damage um, to downstream ecosystems and, and that infrastructure. And, and we saw that time and time again throughout 2023. Um, you can also see here that some of these events are much larger than one inch of rain in 24 hours. So uh, your eye should cue in on, and you might remember the storm at the end of, of June, this dumped four inches of rain and washed out many of the roads in Alexandria and, and impacted a lot of roads throughout the watershed. Other thing I want you to see is these storms that are happening in the winter. Um, these are, are rain on snow events um, that are perennial, perennially tricky to manage. Um, in these events, we're not only dealing with the water that comes into the system as rainfall, but we're also dealing with the, the subsequent snow melt. And we've got the added complication of the soils being frozen. So all of that water is very quickly moving into our streams uh, and into our drainage networks and finding its way to the lake. And we see some significant impacts from these type of events. Um, the last thing I'll mention about this figure as it is now is that, you know, it's, it's one thing to hear climate scientists talk about storm intensities increasing and precipitation changing and our winters warming and wetting, um, but this is really what, what it looks like. And, and while 2023 was anomalous in that we got a lot of rain, these patterns are, are more like what we can be expecting into the future. Um, so, one of the takeaways from tonight's presentation is that if you saw issues in 2023, take that as um, you know a little bit of a forecast of what might be to come, and and let's work together to proactively address stormwater. The other reason 2023 seemed like it rained all the time uh, is because the last couple of years leading up into that 2023 were um, drier than normal. Uh, two of the last three years were droughts. And we can see this really clearly in 2020 when we have uh, one rainstorm here and really no precipitation through May and June, one rainstorm here. And you can see these very clear stair steps. Um, when the figures start to look more curved like this, um, this is when we start to see saturated soil conditions um, throughout the watershed. And we definitely saw that through most of the summer. Um, so yeah, <laughs> to, to put it bluntly, we got a lot of rain in 2023. Now, all of that input has a lot of impact. And so we look at that impact in a number of ways. We've been monitoring water quality in the lake uh, for a long time. We're coming up on the, the 40th year of our lake monitoring efforts. This year will be um, 39, I need to update this slide. Um, and we've been monitoring our tributaries, our streams and our rivers uh, for 19 years this year. Um, we monitor the lake on a weekly basis throughout the summer season at seven long-term sampling locations. And it's really important here to acknowledge the hard work that our water quality volunteers put in um, week after week, year after year, that really allows us to tell this story of Newfound's water quality. Um, if we were to just use the data that we collected as staff or that uh, scientists from UNH come out on a monthly basis to collect, we wouldn't really be able to tell um, the same story with the same level of detail. So my hat is really off to all of our water quality monitors. Um, and this is also a good time to mention that if you value the sort of information that we will talk about moving forward, um, we have a number of ways to engage as a water quality volunteer, uh, and we definitely have some openings um, for our lake monitor. So if you're at all interested, please, please reach out. We look at a lot of things when we're out on the lake um, for tonight's 
purposes, we're only going to focus on the three things that are highlighted in this orange box. Together, these are a good check of overall ecosystem health. And so water clarity is pretty self-explanatory, how deeply we can see into the lake. Um, you know, we do this in a standardized way, but it, it's really a measure of everything that's floating in the water column. Um, so that's algae, bacteria, organic matter, uh, wind, sun can influence this, little schools of fish um, impact this, this reading, but it's, it's really easy and repeatable to take. And so we have a really rich data set when it comes to water clarity. Total phosphorus. Um, total phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in most freshwater aquatic systems. And all we need to know about that uh, is that a little bit of phosphorus goes a long way to spurring the growth of algae and bacteria in a lake. Uh, and by a little bit, I mean a little bit. So to visualize this, uh, it only takes about 10 droplets uh, from an eyedropper to <clears throat> kind of permanently move um, the, the trophic status of the lake. Don't worry about that term. But anyway, to impair... <laughs> Uh, an area of water or volume of water equivalent to an Olympic sized swimming pool. So, so we're really talking in parts per billion here. Um, chlorophyll A, the last indicator that we'll talk about today, is a more direct measurement of um, algae and bacteria. Chlorophyll is the plant pigment that makes leaves green, and it's also the same pigment that makes algae green. So it's it's a good indicator of, of you know, how much algal growth is going on in the lake at any given time. So before we dive into any more graphs, I want to throw um, kind of this report card. This is the quick look summary uh, for uh, water quality in 2023 up on the screen. Um, and there's a lot here, so I'll walk you through this as well. Um, the first thing to note is New Hampshire sets um, standards for high water quality lakes and ponds for each of these parameters. So if, in order for a lake to be classified as having high water quality, we need to see into it uh, more than 13 feet. And we want total phosphorus and chlorophyll to be below eight and 3.3 parts per billion respectively. Now, if we look over at our 2023 numbers, and these are lake-wide averages across all of our sites, we can see that based on these standards, Newfound is still securely in that high water quality category. Um, but I often say that Newfound on a bad day is better than a lot of lakes on their best day. And so comparing our current water quality to these existing state standards, doesn't do a good job of telling us how our lake has changed uh, over time and how our lake has changed in the short term. So in order to do this, we need to be looking at our own water quality record. Um, and we can see <clears throat> that based on our 10-year numbers, uh, we saw some pretty significant declines in water quality across the board. And if we look again over year over year, uh, we see some even more drastic declines. Um, now, this is the point in the presentation where I need to walk people off the ledge a little bit and say that water quality in the long term is for a lake like Newfound is not typically driven by one year's worth of inputs. Newfound is a very deep lake. It's a very large lake. And so it has some capacity to kind of absorb these sorts of pulses. Now, um, I would suspect that we would see some lingering impacts, um, provided we don't have a year like 2023 going into this year. Um, but you know that is to be seen. It's not all bad news this year. Um, Newfound Lake still remains free of invasive aquatic plants. Um, this is a real benefit to not only our lake ecosystems, but to recreation. Um, recreational users, property values, um, and we work very hard to keep it this way. Our jobs would be very different if we were pulling milfoil out of our lake and trying to reclaim some of those ecosystem services. Um, instead, we have two programs, our Lake Host program and our Weed Watcher program, 
um, that really do a good job of both preventing new uh, hitchhiking plants from getting to our lake, in the case of our, our lake hosts. Um, and our weed watchers are a group of trained volunteers that we work with to identify um, native plants and invasive plants uh, in order to field kind of a rapid response should an introduction occur. Um, I'm very happy to say that uh, we had a little bit of a scare back in August, a possible introduction of Eurasian water milfoil, another invasive plant. Um, but um, our weed watchers were able to respond and within 36 hours, we had gone to um, all the boat launches on Newfound. And by the end of the summer, we had completed um, a, a survey of all of Newfound's uh, near shore area. That's 22 plus miles um, of coastline and over a thousand acres of suitable habitat. So, so my, my hat is really off, goes off to our volunteer weed watchers and lake hosts again. Um, and we did not have any harmful algal blooms. So cyanobacteria, uh, you may be familiar with, is, is gaining um, uh, awareness around the state as more developed lakes are dealing with um, the effects of uh, cyanobacteria blooms or harmful algal blooms. Um, let me rewind here a little bit and say that cyanobacteria are, are naturally occurring. Uh, in most freshwater systems, but when the conditions are, are just right for cyanobacteria uh, or really just wrong for everyone else, um, these naturally occurring organisms can really reproduce exponentially and form these harmful blooms. Um, not only are they harmful to the, the aquatic ecosystems, but certain cyanobacteria produce cyanotoxins, uh, which are harmful to humans and our pets and our animals. Um, and our link to liver and kidney disease and neurological diseases as well. So um, expect some more press from us on this and some more resources for bacteria. Um, but the long and short of it is we don't expect to see harmful algal blooms kind of peripherally across all of Newfound. Um, our nutrients are just too low. The conditions aren't, aren't quite right. But given the year that we've had, uh, we are certainly keeping our eye out in our shallower bays and coves and any kind of backwater areas for cyanobacteria. So if you see anything that looks like paint across, green paint across the surface, um, you know, little bubbles underneath the surface, anything that looks uh, a little out of place, we'd like to know. So give us a call. We'll come out and sample as, as quickly as we can. Um, and, and the mantra is when in doubt, stay out. Um, these things can impact our health. Um, so, so please let us know and, and stay out of the water uh, when you suspect cyanobacteria blooms. Now, I wanna get into some of our long-term water quality um, data, looking at those same parameters, clarity, total phosphorus, and chlorophyll. Uh, I'm gonna look at only the deep site and I'll explain a little bit more as to why in a minute. Um, but I do wanna say that um, long-term water quality was the, the topic of last year's State of the Lake. And we have a number of resources for folks that are really interested in this topic. So the recording of that presentation is uh, available online as is some interpretation um, of the figures you're about to see. Um, so if you've got questions or want to follow up, uh, I'll steer you to our, our website first, and then you know always feel free to, to reach out to me as well. So we look at water quality at the deep site um, as a good indicator of what's happening lake-wide. Our deep site sits over 182 feet of water. It's buffered from any direct influence from um, you know shoreland pollute or shoreline pollution influence from our tributaries. And so trends that are happening at our deep site um, are really a good um, tell of what's happening across the rest of Newfound. Um, so real quickly, what we see here looking at water clarity, again, higher numbers are, are better, is that we see a decline in water quality from the beginning of our record um, through uh, to about the, the late 90s, and 2000. 
uh, we associate this with um, some pretty large scale watershed development that happened in the mid 80s, uh, paired with some large storm events um, that happened in, in the throughout the 1990s. Uh, and so you can imagine that with new development, you have exposed soils, new construction sites, and then large storm events dropping lots of rain move that, that exposed soil and sediment into our lake. Um, and we see a pretty prolonged impact from that, multi-decadal impacts from that. Um, but we see the lake slowly recovering through the mid uh, and early 2000s. This very clear dip here is the impact of Tropical Storm Irene in 2011. And I just want to point out how different the response uh, of the lake is from this slope here to this slope here. It still took several years for the lake to kind of re re respond from Tropical Storm Irene, but uh, that response was quicker than what we saw uh, following that, that building boom. The last thing, two things to note here is that up until last year, Newfound's water quality was at a, a pretty um, even state of, of being really, truly exceptional. Um, you know, when we look at our 10 year numbers, it was pretty common to go to the deep site and see more than 30 feet into our lake. Um, you know, that that's more than double what the current state standard has. And then of course, at the very end, <laughs> we see 2023's numbers up there. And, um, and time will tell uh, how quickly the lake will respond to, to this one bad year. But um, you know, here we really do see the impact of all of um, that stormwater coming into Newfound. Um, Total Phosphorus has, um, tells a similar story, but has a, a different relationship, right? We want Total Phosphorus to be as low as possible, right? Those 10 droplets per that Olympic size swimming pool. Um, so we want to keep these numbers low. And so that building boom in the, in the 80s uh, spurred some growth in total or some increases in total phosphorus um, that peaked in that same 2000-ish time frame. We see that nice steady uh, recovery and then a plateau happen around 4.5 uh, 4 uh, parts per billion. Um, and here too, we see 2023, um, you know, the impact, that big spike at the end. Um, I know some people are really wondering what is going on in this image. And I do just want to say right off the bat that that is not newfound. Uh, this image um, comes from a uh, formative study in lake ecology uh, from the, the late 1970s that we absolutely could not get away with today, where they essentially sectioned off um, a, a lake similar to Newfound in terms of its nutrients and slowly added phosphorus to one half and not the other. So very basic research, very important research uh, in that our understanding of lake nutrient dynamics are really based in this, uh, but also, you know, some very real impacts to, to this one study lake. And of course, um, chlorophyll. So if total phosphorus is again, the limiting nutrient in, in systems, chlorophyll respond very similarly um, because um, total phosphorus is really limiting the growth of uh, algae and bacteria, which is what we measure when we talk about chlorophyll. Um, so we see a very similar pattern. Uh, interestingly enough, it spikes a little bit later than total phosphorus. And this indicates that that phosphorus is lingering in our system for a number of years uh, and available to, um, to different organisms for a number of years. But then again, a slow, steady decline uh, or recovery, a good period of water quality, and then the spike of 2023. Um, and this is the point where I need to say that the statistics that we use to plot this line don't really do well with big differences on either end of a data set. So I wouldn't be surprised as time goes on if this spike here tends to even out, uh, again, provided uh, water quality goes something back to what we're used to. So main takeaways, uh, and I, I've mentioned these kind of at the top of the talk here, um, but when the weather is good and we wanna be out 
enjoying the lake as it is, as we should be. Um, we also need to be thinking about how the watershed uh, functions and the fact that it only takes one big storm um, to really transition what is a very special ecosystem and a very special place to be into something that has the real impact to do damage, not only to the environment, but to our infrastructure as well. Um, and so this, this picture here on the right, um, this is um, Hemlock Brook, which normally is a pretty subdued uh, rocky bottom stream, um, but multiple times this year uh, had reached a pretty severe flood stage. And, and fortunately for the homeowner on the right here, um, they were, were smart enough to, to, to think about getting some sandbags out there and, and holding this within the, the banks a little bit better. Um, they weren't as fortunate the year before and Hemlock Brook came right through their garage. So um, we live in a very interesting, special place, but we, we need to be proactively thinking about stormwater. And for those of you who are interested in that, NLRA is here again as, as that resource for you all. All right, so that ends kind of the nuts and bolts report card um, aspect of tonight's presentation. Rebecca, do we have time for a couple of questions from the chat? Yeah, there no questions have come in through the chat, but I think if there are a few questions that are specifically about the, the data that you just presented, I think now might be a good time for folks to ask. So if you have a question, either put it into the chat and I'll relate it to the group or, um, or go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, Paul, this is Carol. Really great, really great question. So you, at the end, you said some of the things that homeowners have done, you know, to be smart about protecting themselves from stormwater. What are the things that maybe the people on this call in the broader community that we should be thinking about to do with our own properties? Um, part one question and part two, how, how is the NLRA able to help um, work with the community in the surrounding area to be sure we are being good stewards as well? Absolutely. And, and I appreciate the question, Carol. Um, and I appreciate what, what will be a really good, easy segue for, for part three uh, of tonight's presentation. So, so hang on to those questions. Uh, we'll get into kind of six steps that, that you can take to prevent stormwater from uh, impacting your property and the ecosystem, uh, as well as kind of unpack some of the mechanisms there. So um, yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, one more question about the, the data that Paul just presented. Otherwise, we will just move on to the next se uh, section. Great. All right. Okay, so moving on, um, the, the title of this section is Moving Through, uh, Water Moving Through the Landscape. Um, and we are going to kind of uh, compare and contrast natural and developed landscapes. And, and uh, I've kind of condensed what ends up being a lot of, of scientific background and understanding into some very key points. Um, so there's a lot to be said, but um, I'm gonna, for time's sake, move through this relatively quickly. Um, again, those intact healthy ecosystems do a lot of, of, of work to keep water clean in, in throughout the newfound watershed, both in terms of our, our streams and our rivers and our, our, our lake. Um, four main takeaways here are that natural landscapes are composed of, of healthy vegetation. Um, and there's two critical things that vegetation do. Of course, they do a lot in terms of providing habitat for, for animals, et cetera. But in terms of water uh, and kind of the physics of it, um, they absorb a lot of water before it even has a chance to get to our streams. So, um, you may or may not be familiar with Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. This is a world-renowned forest just up the road from us uh, where they care deeply about how much water moves through their watersheds and measure it in uh, you know, six ways till Sunday. And on average, a New Hampshire forest measured at Hubbard Brook um, will uptake and evaporate or transpire 40% of the water that falls on it. 
Um, so right off the, the, the top, we're limiting the amount of water that's, that has the ability to move to our streams to, to kind of cause these environmental impacts. Um, of course, they also have large healthy root systems. Uh, and so I love this picture on the right. And what this is illustrating is the different rooting depths and structures of different native uh, grasses and herbaceous perennials. Um, it's a little hard to make out here, but this uh, scale is in feet from one to 15 down here. And the species don't matter so much. Uh, but what's highlighted here in the center column um, is Kentucky bluegrass. And so this is indicative of a lot of the grasses that we find in our lawn mixes. Um, and you can see just how, um, you know, rooting structure pales in comparison to, to that of our, our native plants. And those roots do a lot in terms of accessing nutrients, water, and of course, holding the soil together. And that's critically important around stream banks and, and, and shorelines. The other thing that natural landscapes do really well is that they have healthy um, soils. And, and we often think of soil as being something very hard underneath of our foot, but in actuality, healthy native soils are only 50% dirt, mineral, organic, or otherwise, uh, and about 50% uh, space. So that's about 25% water, 25% air. And so quite literally, they are a sponge that soaks up a vast amount of water in addition to what the trees process um, in our forests. And of course, in developed landscapes, we tend to suffer from soil compaction, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute. When water gets to our stream networks, um, natural streams tend to meander. They respond to the underlying geology and topography. Um, and I could talk about stream meanders all day, um, challenge me some other time. But for tonight's presentation, um, all I want to say is that when water makes a turn, it slows down. And in doing so, uh, it gives an opportunity for the sediment that, that's carried, especially during these large flood events, to really drop out and not impact things further downstream. So we want to maintain kind of these meandering stream channels as much as possible. Um, lastly, natural river systems um, tend to have floodplains. And so floodplains occur when you've got a, a relatively sizable river um, that reaches a flat level area. Um, so what we're looking at here is kind of the mouth of the Cockermouth River where it enters Newfound Lake. Um, and we can see all of these wonderful meander bends in here um, slowing water down. This is Gray Rocks up here and, and Hebron Town Center here. Um, but if we were to look at any point of this river in cross section, we might see something that looks like this. Um, so in scientific jargon, this is what we call a hydrologically connected floodplain. But what I want you to take away is that there are these different tiers, different terraces that have been carved out by the river over millennia. Right, Newfound Lake's roughly 14,000 years old. And so we've seen lots of large storm events and um, the river has carved these, these floodplain, these terraces uh, over time. And this is really important for managing large storm events like we saw in 2023. Um, not only does the water level increase vertically, but it also has the ability to spread out horizontally. And when it does that, it, it slows the water down and allows that sediment to, to drop out. Um, this is important for a lot of reasons, water quality being one of them, but that sediment that's carried um, also fosters a really unique and diverse ecosystem. So I mentioned that Gray Rocks is part of the Cockermouth River floodplain system. Um, and we've done some ecological surveys there and at the Bean Wildlife Sanctuary, which is um, directly next to Gray Rocks, and we found 400, over 400 species uh, of plants, animals, and insects. So uh, maintaining these uh, floodplains is, is really critically important for flood control and for biodiversity. Now we're gonna switch to the developed landscape, which is something I think we are all very well familiar with. So I'm gonna try to go even a little quicker. Um, 
So developed landscapes are really characterized by the amount of impervious cover. Uh, and so impervious surfaces are anything that doesn't allow water to, to filter through, to soak into the ground. So um, far and away, pavement, uh, gravel roads, compacted gravel roads, um, <clears throat> roofs are uh, our largest sources of impervious cover. And, and what they do is replace, um, you know, natural ecosystems where that soil or that soil is absorbing water, those plants are transpiring water, and they create uh, points of concentration. So in developed landscape, it's always a question of what do we do with all this stormwater? Because <laughs> it's not soaking into the grounds. And so we tend to develop and build um, you know, drainage networks that that mimic natural systems in some ways, but but fall short in other ways, which I'll talk about in, in just a minute. Um, soil compaction, um, this is a big one. Um, so I already mentioned that water holding capacity of natural soils and compacted soils are, are really just a consequence of, of the way uh, which we build buildings and, and use heavy machinery. It's, it's somewhat unavoidable. Um, but can be rectified uh, if we're paying attention to it. Um, you know, typically what happens when you have a large construction project is you've, you've run over the site with machines, uh, you've compacted that soil, you bring in a couple of truckloads of loam, spread it out, and, and throw your Kentucky bluegrass out and, and call it a day. Um, but what we find is that when the soil is exposed is really the best time to engage in stormwater planning. Well, before that is the best time to engage in stormwater planning, but because you've got those machines on site and you have to do something with the landscaping anyway, um, you know, getting in in the planning phase and, and changing a few tweaks about the landscaping really sets a property up to limit the amount of stormwater pollution that it generates for the life of that entire building. Um, so it's, it's a really critical time. And um, I wanted to, to throw this out to anyone who's considering doing major renovation or um, new construction in the watershed that, that we are here as a resource to help you with that planning design process. Of course, um, water gets concentrated uh, and it needs to go somewhere. And so we tend to channelize our, our runoff and our streams um, to avoid areas where we don't want it to go. Uh, and, and we do so in ways that don't always make sense uh, don't always square with the simple fact that water likes to run downhill. Um, this image is, is a, a great case study in this. This is taken uh, right after a two inch rainstorm. And what we see is what is normally a non-existent stormwater channel uh, bubbling over like a very nice looking trout stream, except it's coming through someone's yard. Um, and it, we expect it to make a right turn to avoid washing out this road and it's really trying to be channeled through an undersized culvert that's already filled with sediment. And of course, that, that water doesn't want to do that. It doesn't like to make right turns. And, and it certainly doesn't like to be forced into a very small, constricted pipe. And so it, it cuts its own channel. Um, in the watershed, we have a, a pretty significant network of gravel roads. And in years like we just had, we saw the shortcomings in a lot of these gravel roads. Um, and it's in one way, it's, it's easier to repair a gravel road than a paved road in that you just bring in more gravel. But my point is, is that when we saw issues in the road, we need to be not replacing like for like, but increasing the size of our stormwater drainages so we, we don't have this sort of road washouts that we've seen time and time again this year. Um, water moving through a developed landscape also picks up whatever we apply to that developed landscape. So this image is on Shore Drive in Bristol, uh, and this is literally water circling a drain <laughs> that's maybe 100 feet from, from Newfound. Um, and of course, um, you know, we apply lawn chemicals, we have trash, wastewater products, um, septic leachate, all of these things um, get into our water system when we have flood conditions like you see in the image here. The last thing we do um, pretty frequently is we constrain those natural floodplains that I mentioned, right? Because 
Uh, we live in a very steep watershed. I mentioned that at the top. Um, and we like to build things where it's flat. And that happens to often be in our natural floodplains. Um, so returning here to uh, Hemlock Brook, um, we see that on the uphill side of Route 3A, we've constrained it with by building a road. Uh, even though we have a really nice box culvert bridge for that stream to go under during uh, large flood events, it almost comes up over the road. Um, you know, the, the Cockermouth River floodplain in Hebron comes up over the road frequently, and so does the Fowler River. Um, a little less frequently, but it, it's not uncommon that we see the Fowler River coming up over West Shore Road. Um, and so maintaining those natural floodplains is critically important or building in some of that capacity to, to, to manage different size flows um, is, is something that we can all take away. So uh, Carol had asked about you know, things that you can do um, to limit the impact of stormwater both on your property and in the environment. And these are kind of my six rules to live by. They're not, um, you know, do this and things will be better, but it's more think about this and 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 work to, to, to tailor these ideas to your site. And again, that's something that NLRA is here to help you do. So the first one is really limit impervious surfaces. And I will be the first one to realize that we don't often shrink the size of our buildings or change the, the size of our parking lots. Uh, for folks that maybe are doing some, some repair on gravel work or gravel roads or maybe sick of uh, dragging dirt into their, their house from a gravel parking lot or driveway, um, there are a number of technologies that, that didn't really exist 20 years ago um, that allow water to, to move into the ground. But there's one thing, uh, although it's not truly impervious, um, that we can all do um, to limit stormwater generation, and that's going backwards in my slide deck, um, <laughs> it's limiting the amount of grass. Um, so I show you that image of Kentucky bluegrass and the rooting depth. Um, and, and typically on a build site uh, or on any residential site, the, the impact of soil compaction, um, the dense growth of, of root structure and the thatch that forms in a maintained lawn, even in the best case scenario, only about 15 to 20 percent of the water that falls on a lawn is soaking into the ground. And so as a result, um, lawns represent a kind of net source of stormwater. And simply by mowing less frequently, by planting some native species instead of lawn, we can work to kind of combat that soil compaction um, and really make a big difference moving forward. Um, next is infiltrate near the source, right? When water moves downhill, just like it does in our steep streams, it quickly um, gains enough force to do some damage. So we want to get that water into the ground as quickly as possible. Um, and there are a number of ways to do this. These are my two preferred options. They're both extremely low tech, but extremely effective. And so what we're looking at here is a infiltration trench right next to a, a gravel parking area. And this is two shovel widths wide and maybe one and a half shovel widths deep filled with some clean washed stone, um, which you can buy at the local landscaping supply, um, covered up with some filter fabric. And it does a really effective job at keeping that water from, from sheeting downhill. Um, Roofs are our next largest source of stormwater concentration. Um, and I always tell people that a 10 by 10 foot area, uh, so 100 square feet, which is probably smaller than the room you're all watching this presentation from, um, will generate about 68 gallons of water for every inch of rain that falls. So we're, we're talking some significant volumes. And if we look at a normal year, uh, an average size house in Newfound will generate uh, around 38,000 gallons. So it's it's critically important that we deal with this water rather than letting it drain uh, off downhill or downstream of our, our, of our homes. So um, the way we do that uh, for roof 
runoff, uh, if you've got gutters, is by what we call a dug dry well. It is no more than a uh, large hole in the ground. This is about uh, three by three by two foot deep and um, backfilled with that same washed river stone. Um, and it does a tremendous job at getting that water into the ground. Um, next rule to live by is to disperse often, right? We, if we can't keep water from moving downhill, we wanna make sure that it doesn't have the opportunity to, um, to concentrate with other water and, and do more damage. And so this is another project that NLRA had done this past summer, um, <clears throat> installing an armored um, driveway turnout. Um, this situation uh, is a, a um, paved, st steeply paved driveway and the erosion had gotten so bad that it was undermining um, that driveway. It started to wash out and the driveway was starting to, to cut in. And um, another low tech, but very effective solution is just to put some, some river stone uh, in the existing erosion ditch and, and do a little bit of sculpting, um, but to really prevent that water from, from causing any issues farther down. Thinking like uh, a river and thinking about those meandering bends, any time that we can slow stormwater down, uh, we should be doing that. And there are two main ways to do it. Um, they, again, are, are low tech, but effective. Terracing um, a hill slope. So reducing the slope um, by creating these steps in the landscape is a really effective way. Um, this is something that we see uh, pretty frequently around the lake itself, just because our shoreline is so steep. Um, but it doesn't need um, costly or expensive rock work. Um, these vegetated um, terraces do a really good job of holding the soil in place as well. Uh, the other image up here, um, this is what would otherwise be, excuse me, a, um, a, a normal road drainage, maybe a vegetated swale or, or you know, just a ditch that's left to erode. And instead, these folks have created what looks like a dry stream bed uh, with some meanders, but also importantly, with some material that is physically going to slow the water down. And we've got some nice native plantings um, built on the side. So this is really the ideal for road drainage here. The last thing is, well, second to last thing is planning for large events, um, right? By and large, um, our stormwater infrastructure uh, constrains water as it moves away from, from the source. So what I mean by that is a culvert is really a one size fits, is not a one size fits all solution. Uh, it's really designed to handle um, a very small range of, of water volumes, and after which it just becomes um, a, a point in the system where water will move around it. Um, so if we can think like a river uh, and, and layer in different stormwater practices um, to ensure that we can handle different flows uh, and different intensity of rainfalls, all the better. So what does this look like in practice? Um, first is making sure that our stormwater um, is moved away from sensitive areas, whether that's uh, our, our buildings, um, garden beds with erodible soils, um, or keeping that water away from na na natural streams or water bodies for as long as possible and trying to get into the ground as often as possible. Um, so here's another good example of, of, you know, washed river stone at work. Um, this is not an installation that we did, but I like this for a number of reasons. Number one, there's a, a shallow um, channel shape to it, which allows water to, to flow at different volumes um, without causing damage. There's some nice stepping stones in here rather than any sort of pavers, um, and you've got that nice um, coarse aggregate that's going to trap sediment and slow water down before it reaches this, this catch basin. And of course, the last thing is, let's plant some plants. <laughs> um, we, we often tend to think about solving problems in the built environment with more building, uh, but if there's one takeaway we can take from our native ecosystems, it's that plants are really, really good at dealing with water. Um, this is 
really important around uh, our shorelines and our stream banks, but really can be implemented on all of our properties to combat soil compaction. Uh, and there's a host of other benefits that native plantings have in terms of wildlife um, <clears throat> and the greater ecosystem. All right, Rebecca, that was that was uh, section two. Any questions in the chat? There are no questions in the chat, um, and we are at five o'clock, so we have about half an hour left. I'd say let's um, let's continue on, and then we'll do some Q and A at the end. Great, cool. I will try to speed through this as well. Um, <clears throat> so NLRA is here uh, as your watershed resource for dealing with stormwater. Um, we do this in a number of ways. Um, our small scale stormwater program is really tailored to uh, property owners, whether that's individual homeowners, uh, homeowners association, beach associations, road associations. Um, you know, we have a suite of different services to offer everything from DIY guides and fact sheets um, all the way through uh, full designs um, and, <clears throat> and project assistance. Um, NLRA is here to help you respond to stormwater emergencies. Uh, if you have an active erosion issue, um, you can call me up um, following any large storm event and I can come out and help problem solve in the field and develop some next steps for you to take. Um, we can identify uh, and, and try to quantify sources of stormwater concentration on your property through our site assessment program. We offer Lake Smart certification. So this is a program through our partners at NH Lakes, which is a statewide um, organization doing lake advocacy work. And Lake Smart is really a program to, to recognize and to help people along who want to do um, their level best um, by protecting the lake through their landscaping. Um, so that is that is a, a a program that we offer. And for projects of the right scope, scale, and impact, um, <clears throat> we can we have some ability to do some direct project assistance. So we uh, every summer we have a small crew of AmeriCorps watershed stewards that are able to install some of the stormwater projects that, that I've I've seen. Um, so this image here, this is Kate and Fred Ruoff. We were at their, their cottage on the lake uh, for a week this past summer um, in, in May, and we installed um, infiltrations, we installed gardens, and it's not often that we get the opportunity to test our stormwater installations uh, with quite the frequency that we did this year. And, and what I can say is that our work uh, was tested time and time again and, and proved to stand up um, really well to the storms that we saw this past year. So th these simple low-tech solutions have a big impact. Um, NLRA also works at a much larger level, um, primarily through our watershed management plan, plan with watershed towns. Um, our watershed management plan is an official document on record um, with New Hampshire DES that, that does a number of things, but in terms of stormwater, it really identifies those major sources of stormwater pollution. Um, and it allows us to partner with state and federal agencies to pursue funding and expertise. Um, and it really guides NLRA's work at, at a large, larger scale. Um, we are currently in our fourth implementation phase of this plan. So um, we stay current on this list and we try to tick away um, when we can uh, at these, these major major sources of pollution. So I had mentioned back in the nuts and bolts uh, section that we can't always compare, uh, it's, it's not always helpful to compare Newfound's water quality um, to existing state standards uh, because that, that sentiment that Newfound on a bad day is, is better than a lot of lakes on their best day. And so one of the big steps that we took in 2023 was to sit down and form a committee and, and go about setting specific water quality targets for Newfound Lake. Um, water quality targets in general 
um, do a really good job and allow resource managers and um, and decision makers to evaluate lake health, communicate that to the general public, um, but also evaluate the effectiveness of management actions and, and really allow us to proactively uh, manage and protect Newfound Lake moving forward, right? Uh, we sat down as a committee um, and the committee I should say was formed of folks from NLRA, uh, Rebecca and myself were on it, as well as some of our trustees, but also our two um, representatives from our volunteer water quality monitors, uh, as well as scientists from UNH and resource managers from New Hampshire DES. Um, but what newfound specific targets allow us to do um, is to to not sit by and wait for, for Newfound's water quality to be degraded to the point in which the state standards kick in, but to really um, proactively manage our, our water quality and protect it. Um, <clears throat> the committee decided to focus on three sites, three of our seven lake sites. Uh, the deep site, of course, because it is the best indicator of lake-wide trends, um, but we also chose to look at Pasquani and Mayhew, shown here in red, um, as two of our more developed watersheds, sub-watersheds. Um, and we've seen historic declines in water, or we've seen declines in water quality historically at both of these sites. Um, I think that's owed to the watershed development, but then also to what's happening out in the, the larger watershed. So, the, for Mayhew, for example, receives a lot of influence from the Fowler River down here. You can kind of see the outwash of the Fowler moving through here. So by setting specific water quality targets for Mayhew, we're also kind of monitoring what's happening in the whole Fowler uh, River watershed, which, which makes up a large percentage of the overall newfound watershed. Um, similarly, in Pasquani Bay, uh, we've got lots of development around the shoreline, but then also we've got three smaller tributaries that drain quite a lot of the town of Bridgewater coming in there as well. Um, we are looking at um, the same three indicators that we've already talked about, so clarity, phosphorus, and chlorophyll. Um, and the committee chose to um, set specific targets for each indicator uh, by each site. Um, really in an effort to maintain uh, existing excellent water quality in, in Newfound. Um, we started this work in 2023 before we had the data from this, this previous year. So what we're really looking at is um, the 10-year uh, median uh, for 2013 to 2022. And so what I've done here uh, these are figures that we've already seen, uh, the deep site transparency. The blue here is indicating that 10 year time period and the orange bar here is the actual target. And so I want to be clear um, that while we're setting a goal to maintain water quality to this um, standard, what we know about climate change, um, what we know about watershed development and the impacts of, of that um, really make maintaining water quality over this time um, a pretty ambitious goal, right? Um, not only are we fighting the effects of climate change and watershed development, but we've set this target at a period where water quality um, was pretty high uh, compared to the rest of the record. Um, so here we have the same graphs for total phosphorus at the deep site and chlorophyll. So good, good water quality across all three measures during this, this target period. Um, and the committee also believed that maintaining uh, is, is ambitious, but perhaps not enough. So we also dug into where we can improve water quality uh, where it's it's realistic and feasible. And we believe that um, seeing some declines or some, some decreases in chlorophyll concentration or improvement in overall water quality is possible at both the Mayhew site and Pisquani. Now, this is not going to be uh, an easy lift by any stretch, but 
Um, if we look at these two sites here in these figures, um, we can see that these chlorophyll was on the decline at both of these sites before 2023. And we, we want to continue that trend if at all possible. And so this will take work uh, working with folks on the shore. It'll take work working with folks out in the watershed. It'll take work working with the towns. Um, but I think we, we want this to really motivate uh, folks so that we can see the sort of impact and protect Newfound Lake moving forward. Again, uh, another table with a lot of numbers on it. And the only thing I really want you to take away, feel free to jot down any of these numbers. Uh, these are the actual targets per site by parameter. Um, but if we just compare uh, the targets that we've set to the existing state standards, you can see how, um, how much of an improvement they are for Newfound. Um, you can also see that what this means for Pasquani and Mayhew is that we're really trying to rewind the clock about 10 years and build in an added layer of watershed resilience um, in the face of, of climate change. Now, um, <laughs> this, is, this is very important work that I'm excited to share with you. But if we look at 2023 by comparison, we can see that one year, um, can can really skew these numbers quite a bit. And so water quality is best judged over a long period, um, but it's not out of the realm um, of possibility to see these numbers change uh, for the better or for the worse. Um, so the work of protecting the, the lake really is out in the watershed, and that's work that NLRA is familiar with and excited to, to continue and expand moving forward. So my main takeaway um, is that we all have a role to, to play in ensuring a healthy future for Newfound Lake. Um, there are so many ways to get involved, and the strength of our work is really reliant on people like yourselves um, helping us out and, and protecting your little patch of the watershed in whatever way you can. Um, if you are not familiar with NLRA or would like to become more familiar with us, um, please attend any of our upcoming events. Um, you know, there are numbers of ways to volunteer, uh, become a member so you get all of our information. And then my two, two uh, stormwater PSAs are go out and plant some native vegetation and uh, clean your culverts. It's, it's mud season, y'all, and uh, things are starting to thaw. And uh, a clean culvert uh, removes a headache for you. Uh, of, of a potential washout and does a world of good to protect the watershed. So uh, with that, I will uh, open up for some questions. Paul, we had one question in the chat that I, I started to answer, but I think I'd like to throw to you as well. Um, there was a question about um, how you reduce the amount of chlorophyll A in the lake. And my response was you reduce the input of phosphorus as phosphorus is often the limiting or is the limiting nutrient in temperate freshwater lakes. Um, and you reduce phosphorus by reducing sediment input and stormwater influence to the lake. But I just want to make sure that, you know, you get an opportunity to answer the rest of that question. If yeah, there's... yeah. And I, th I think, Rebecca, you, you kind of touched on a lot of the, the important points there. And, and I guess the one thing I didn't uh, really touch on is where phosphorus comes from. <laughs> And I, th I think that's an important thing. So phosphorus uh, is naturally found in our native soils. Um, just like nitrogen is often the limiting nutrient in terrestrial or, or, or on the sh shore ecosystems, upland ecosystems, um, phosphorus is part of our soils as well. We need phosphorus to grow plants. Our bodies are comprised of a lot of phosphorus. So, so sources of phosphorus, major sources are um, sediment from erosion, of native soils, um, leachate from se septic systems, um, lawn fertilizers, chemicals, household chemicals. There was a, a long time when detergents had a lot of phosphorus in them. Those days have thankfully kind of come to an end. Um, there is also an atmospheric influence, but by how we control chlorophyll is limiting phosphorus and how we limit phosphorus is by limiting stormwater pollution. So the only other thing in the chat are just uh, some uh, kudos for you, Paul. Um, and so I, I think if anybody else, we have a few more minutes set aside for questions. So if anyone else wants to either put a, 
question in the chat or just remove, take themselves off mute and ask a question, I would welcome anyone to do so. John, everyone oh, jump in at once. I see a question that says, is it, is it a good thing when plants grown in the stone beds we have created? By and large, so I'm, I'm going to interpret this question a little bit and, and correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, in the stone beds that we've created, so if we've installed um, some coarse gravel to prevent erosion from happening uh, and you've got plants growing there, that's that's an indication to me that enough sediment has been trapped uh, in those stones to support roots of a plant. Um, and so I think that's a good thing uh, that you're trapping that sediment, uh, let those plants grow. Um, but it also points to any good stormwater control will be trapping sediment and will require maintenance over time. Um, and so what I would suggest is if you start to see lots of water moving through, um, you know, what if, if this is a stone channel, um, you know, it might be time to, to top that up with some new fresh stone. Um, question about septic. How do you measure septic leaching into the lake? Yeah, so Rebecca, feel free to jump in on this one. I'm going to try to tee it up a little bit. This is more, more your wheelhouse than mine, but <clears throat> there are a number of ways to do it. Um, the most simple is by measuring E. coli content. So this is a bacteria uh, that's found in fecal material, human and natural. Um, but oftentimes for public beaches, we're measuring E. coli to look for, for spikes from a public health perspective. Um, <clears throat> but there are other ways to kind of um, just slice out that human component. So there are some techniques using um, artificial brighteners that come from um, laundry detergent and bleach. Uh, so if we find these kind of chemical signals of of household chemicals in our water, we can assume that that's coming from, from septic systems or a direct input, which is a little less likely. I was just gonna say another way to measure is uh, caffeine. Um, and, uh, and that it is often an indicator of how much um, septic might be getting into a body of water. But the, the short answer is it's really, it's not possible to directly measure septic. You're looking at proxy measurements essentially. Um, when we can model the impact of septic systems um, onto the lake based on some data, and the estimate on newfound is I think six percent of the phosphorus is has been um, estimated to be coming from groundwater, and presumably that is coming from septic systems. Um, I do want to take this opportunity though to to say that um, you know septics are an an opportunity for us to maintain systems in a healthy way, right? Um, you know, not just getting your septic tank pumped regularly, but also inspecting your leach field, right? So there's two two main components to a septic, and, and Rebecca, keep me on, on time on this one because I could go on for a while. Um, but we often look at the health of a system by looking at, you know, the septic tank where all the sewage is, is held, but, but really it relies on the functioning of the leach field itself. And so um, there are companies that we can refer that will go and investigate how well that leach field is performing and, and you know, if you can do things to, to um, increase the, the performance and, and life of that, that system. Um, it's it's a, one of those win-win situations where it benefits you uh, and benefits the environment. Um, let's see, one more question. Is runoff worse in winter with in the winter with little snow, but a lot of rain versus a winter with lots of snow? Um, and um, I will say I do better with a winter with lots of snow and no rain. But Paul, how does uh, how does the runoff handle handle it? Yeah, no. And, and, and you know, I'm going to give the, uh, the you know, un, unsatisfactory answer of uh, it depends. It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think on one hand, a lot of snow and a lot of rain equals more water volume and more impact. Um, snow does have the ability to kind of um, store some of that rainwater and slow it down. Um, I would think, and the other thing that snow does is it holds a lot of the plant material and debris on the ground. 
Um, and so keeping that stuff from washing out into our water bodies in mass during the winter is, is really important. So I'm, I'm also pro snow. Great. Um, it's great that it's both good for, you know, me and for the lake. So, um, <laughs> So it looks like the only remaining question was about the recording. We are recording this and we will be making this available for um, for folks on our website and we'll probably share it in our email newsletter. Um, if you have any other questions um, at any point about water quality, how we're managing it, how we're studying it, or if you would like to help contribute to our nearly four decades of water quality data, which is really important when we make decisions about management, we do need some more water quality volunteers out on the lake. So please get in touch. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Paul. Um, this has been a great Encore presentation and we're glad you could all make it. Yeah, thank, thank you all and have a great night. And uh, Hopefully, if you're far away, this this gets you a little bit more engaged with uh, the watershed that you care so deeply about. Have a good night, everyone.